the structural strength in a few spots. We've also implemented a few changes across both ship and tower to try and speed up the post-catch timeline. Returning vehicles to the launch site leverages the same hardware that we use for stacking ahead of flight, making our infrastructure multi-purpose. And in order for us to achieve that rapid reusability that we keep talking about, we need a quick turnaround. And you can't get much faster than returning the launch vehicle right back there to where it needs to launch from again. <laughs> exactly. In this video, you can see our original render of Booster Catch alongside the actual footage of Catch from Flight 5. This video is just mind-blowing to see the predicted versus reality. And just like the last flight for today's Booster Catch, there are thousands of criteria that need to be met in order to proceed with Catch. Automated checks have to indicate we have a healthy booster and a healthy tower, and the flight director must issue a manual command, which is informed by manual checks from the flight control team. If this command is not sent prior to the completion of the boost back burn, or if automated health checks show unacceptable conditions with Super Heavy or the tower, the booster will default to a trajectory that takes it to a landing burn and soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. I remember when we first heard the call out that tower was go for catch on flight five and wow, I still get goosebumps when I think about that <laughs> moment. Now for today's test, just like flight five, we're only going to catch if everything on the booster and the tower checks out after launch. As always, we accept no compromises when it comes to the safety of the public and our team. And so to that end, the area around the pad and the flight path are cleared in advance. A lot of things have to go right in order to line up the booster catch. So if all criteria is met, we will attempt to catch, but there is a chance that we may not. Either way, we'll be getting tons of in-flight data, which is extremely valuable. Exactly. That first catch was pretty epic though. So like you, we'll be keeping our hopes high to see another one this afternoon. Now, Dan, you got to see it in person last time. <laughs> Are you mentally prepared for a possible round two? I, I mean, probably not. That was pretty hands down the coolest thing I've ever seen. And the fact that we're going to do that every time now breaks my brain a little bit, uh, but it was absolutely incredible. Uh, one of the unique aspects with Super Heavy coming back is it does generate a sonic boom. This is something commonly associated with reusable spacecraft. It's just, it's coming in faster than the speed of sound and then slowing down. It creates that pressure wave that builds up. And then when it reaches you on the ground, that rapid change in pressure is that quick thunderclap sound that you hear. Now, generally the only effect is that thunderclap, uh, that thunderclap sound. Uh, but if you're not expecting it, it's definitely gonna get your attention. And we were able to hear it last time. Um, the impact of, or how loud it is, changes pretty dramatically. And in this video, you can see as we were descending, and there was kind of that, that quick triple pop that you heard. Uh, now that was picked up from closer to the pad. Most people at our distance and further away, you're only gonna hear one or two as they're happening kind of so on top of each other that it might just sound like one big bang. Uh, but as I said, that's, that's something that's only associated with spacecraft being reused. We hear it with Falcon 9. We heard it during shuttle uh, and looking forward to hopefully hearing it today. Uh, just a quick status check though. We're about 85% full on ship, uh, almost two thirds of the way full on booster, continuing to count down about 13 and a half minutes under, a little under that until we lift off today, uh, but still looking good. I'll check back in with you guys in a few minutes. Back over to Jesse and Kate. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I, I think Dan said it really well when it really does hurt the brain to think that this is going to be the norm, that this is just the beginning. Every one of these flights is a step closer to a fully operational Starship that will take us beyond Earth orbit. And with our pace of rapid iteration here, the Moon and Mars are not nearly as far in the future as you may think. In fact, we're planning to send Starships to Mars as soon as 2026 which is when the next Mars transfer window opens, which is under two years from now. Now you might be familiar with the Starlink logo, which you see there on your screen. It's an iconic representation of the Mars transfer orbit, also called the Hellman transfer orbit. This transfer window, or the time between, the time when Earth and Mars are closest to each other, opens every 26 months and is only open for about two to three months at a time for a vehicle with Starship's power. Lining up a launch to Mars is similar to how we launch to the International Space Station, where we timed the launches to match the station's orbit. If we didn't do this, we would need more propellant and more time to get there. 
So the first opportunity we have to fly Starships to Mars, we plan to go for it. These first flight tests to Mars will be uncrewed and will test the reliability of landing in tech. If those landings go well, the first crewed flights will soon follow after that. Right now, our flight tests are focused on proving out reusability of both Super Heavy and Starship. In 2025, we'll continue that focus while also potentially flying our first Starlink missions and demonstrate capabilities central to our role in taking astronauts to the moon as part of NASA's Artemis program. Starship will be used to land astronauts on the lunar surface on NASA's Artemis III mission, which will put the first humans on the moon since 1972. One key capability will be the ability to refuel Starship on orbit, which you can see there on your screen, with a Starship prop tanker docked with a fuel depot. Next year, we're planning to test this capability by, capability by launching two Starships and having them meet up to transfer tons of cryogenic propellants. And when the time comes to land on the moon, Starship will link up with NASA's Orion spacecraft in lunar orbit, where astronauts will transfer over for their descent. Now, once on the lunar surface, they'll ride the elevator down in their Axiom EMU spacesuits from Axiom Space and leave the first footprints on the moon in more than half a century, kickstarting humanity's mission to establish a sustainable presence there. And coming soon to a moon base alpha near you, Starship Enterprise Edition. That is so exciting <laughs> and all the advancements that are going to come in order to enable, order to enable all of that. Now, our rapid iterative development approach has been the basis for all of SpaceX's major innovative advancements, including Falcon, Dragon, and Starlink. Today, we're testing hardware and systems, and we need to know how they perform under the most extreme conditions. And what's more extreme than the flight environment? <laughs> We'd much rather find the bugs and limits now during testing than later on when there's more on the line. And to reiterate, while we do determine a acceptable a an acceptable level of technical risk on our vehicle and pad to learn as fast as possible, we accept no compromises when it comes to the safety of the public or our team. So all of that to say, this is only the sixth of many future flight tests of Starship before it becomes fully operational. And we tend to do our testing out in the open, just like today. And that means people sometimes see when our hardware doesn't perform as we planned during that testing. And that's okay because this is exactly what we are testing for, to physically see if hardware performance matches what we expect it to do or not. Even more with today's test flight, where we're purposefully pushing the ship beyond its limits. Starship development is also being aided by Starlink space-based connectivity. You might remember the Starlink panels that are incorporated into Starship, and you can see them there on your screen, those rectangular panels on Starship's nose cone. Starlink brings us the epic views in space and on reentry, and also helps deliver us critical flight data engineers need to continue development. Yeah, Starlink continues to help us push the limits in space in the short term by providing great views and real-time data on our next few flights, particularly through reentry which spaceflight veterans know that that is historically a period of blackout for all communications within spaceflight. Outside of Starship, Starlink has helped people across the globe, particularly in rural and remote areas that have been underserved by traditional broadband internet. Yeah, and soon Starship will deploy our next generation Starlink satellites, which will continue to increase our capability to connect even more people with high-speed internet all around the world and beyond. Now, as we continue to prepare for our next several flight tests, we recently performed a cryo-proof test of the Starship for Flight 7, our first operation with a vehicle debuting a number of major milestones. The ship has been stretched uh, to make room for larger propellant tanks, increasing, increasing the propellant capacity from 1,200 tons to 1,500 tons. The forward flaps also got a redesign. They have shrunk in size and they also shifted in location. And both of these things will help better protect them during entry heating while still providing control. There's also a wide range of upgrades that will make the vehicle more reliable, adding redundancy to and the ability to operate for longer durations in space. One unique aspect of a trip to Mars are the different conditions ship will see when entering the Martian atmosphere. Now, it's difficult to simulate Mars at Mars's atmosphere when re-entering on Earth, so we've been testing a variety of heat shield materials inside a specialized plasma jet chamber at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign 
where we're able to more closely simulate Mars's 95% carbon dioxide atmosphere. Aside from looking awesome, this is important <laughs> testing. The intense heat of entry will cause the CO2 to break down into its base elements, exposing Starship to atomic oxygen, which increases surface heating and can cause materials to oxidize or start to break down. Spacecraft entering over Mars encountered more than twice the amount of atomic oxygen at their peak when compared to Earth, and that is certainly a unique challenge. As we continue to test, we'll learn more about what makes a great heat shield for Mars. All right, now that we're heading into the final minutes of the countdown, let's go back to Dan for the latest on the ground there at Starbase. Hey, Kate, uh, afraid I have nothing but good news for you. We have a go from our range safety team. Uh, we are a little over 90% full on ship, uh, almost 85% full on booster, uh, and not tracking any holds to an on-time liftoff. So we've got about three more minutes of prop load. As long as the range stays clear, we don't trip any other holds. We might blow right past that T-minus 40-second mark and lift off right at the top of our window at 4 p.m. Central. So toss it back to you guys one more time. But fun part about to start, we are, what, a little under six minutes away from launch. All right, so we are continuing to progress now at five minutes and 43 seconds until liftoff. Now, once we pass the T minus 40 second mark, a number of events are going to occur in rapid succession. The ground spin and ignition systems will come up to flight pressure and the ship will go on to internal power. And then after that, the quick disconnect or what we call the QD arm lockout is removed in preparation for retraction shortly after T zero. And once we pass the T minus 40 second mark, we still have the ability to recycle the count under certain conditions back to T minus 40 seconds and then hold there to assess what happened and if we can proceed again to T zero. Exactly. However, once the water for the deflector system begins flowing at T minus 10 seconds, any issue after that would be an automatic scrub for the day as the teams would need to refill the deflector's water tanks as well as the propellant storage tanks over at the tank farm before we're able to make another attempt. Now, it is just so unbelievable that it's just been only a little over a month, and we are just a few minutes away from Flight 6. Uh, the crowd here is building up. We've got a much larger crowd here than when we were uh, launching at 4 or 5 in the morning yep. <laughs> out here. So very exciting to have an afternoon launch to have all the employees here. Exactly. Now, just as a reminder, uh, that T minus 40 second uh, hold, if we uh, opt to use it, everything is still potentially go for launch. So nothing to be worried about there. Uh, at that point, basically up until T minus 40 seconds, all aborts are just holds. Uh, this would allow the team to wait for final checkouts to assess propellant levels, engines, avionics, vehicle pressurization, you know, range, weather. Occasionally we've had shrimp boats lingering in the past, <laughs> uh, but that doesn't sound like that is the case today. Yeah, not today, no shrimp boats, which is great. Everything so far is looking good. We're getting really excited here, just a few minutes away. We're gonna go back, uh, send it over to Dan in Starbase. Uh, how's it going, Dan? It is still going great. Just coming up on about three and a half minutes away. So we should be done with our prop load on ship momentarily. Then about 30 seconds later, we'll close out on booster. Uh, our flight control team on board or in the building just behind me, not on board. Some of them might wish they were on board. Flight control team in the building behind me, they're going to have a lot of work to do right after we lift off uh, as we still have a lot of manual checks that happen on the tower prior to the flight director, who's going to be Tristan Pierce again today, giving a manual command to bring the booster back to the launch site. And we had, the tower did just incredibly well on the last flight. We didn't lose any of our required redundancy for a catch. So we're hoping to see that again today. Uh, a lot of the team, you know, really putting armor on the tower, making all of those things work, uh, played a huge role in making that catch possible and looking forward to hopefully seeing that happen again. Uh, and of course, sending our first payload to space. You can see the banana. It's very tightly secured, but I assure you it does have some room to float around. So once we're in a zero gravity environment, we should see our first Starship Zero Gravity indicator putting on a little bit of a show. Uh, and that's looking right in. That's where we're going to have Starlink. That's our PEZ deployer. Um, so getting its ride to space. So coming up on about two and a half minutes, we are closing out on all of our prop load. Uh, yep, just heard that our fill drains are starting to close. So that means we're no longer going to be flowing propellant into the booster and the ship. 
we're going to do what's called pushbacks. So all of that propellant in the ground systems is going to get pushed back to the tanks, clear out everything around the pad uh, right before we light those 33 engines and take off. Uh, just quick reminder, you're going to see fire start at the bottom. You're going to see the deflector start at about 10 seconds before launch. Lots of water to help dissipate all that heat, all that sound. And then the engine starting up in three different groups. And then about a second after T0, we should see liftoff. Uh, about two and a half minutes into the flight, a little bit longer, we'll see hot staging. And that's when we're going to be listening really close on those loops to see if we're going to be bringing the booster back for a catch today. Do always want to caution, it's never a guarantee. We've done this once. We'll see if we do it again. We're only going to do it if the booster and the tower are looking really good uh, before we attempt to bring it back here. But coming up on a minute, not tracking any holds on the board right now. So as long as we don't have any last second things, which do happen. All right, flight director just confirmed T minus one minute. Key moment to look at in 10 seconds, that T minus 40. And we flew right through that. Flight directors go for launch. All right, we're now T minus 20 seconds until liftoff of Starship Flight 6. This will mark our second attempt to catch the super heavy booster at the launch tower, as well as. Vehicle is pitching downrange. Booster Raptor, chamber pressure nominal. Booster and ship, avionics power and telemetry nominal. All right, we're max, just a little over a minute maximum into flight. Dynamic pressure. We're about six miles away, so all the sound's still hitting us here. Hearing good call-outs, that power telemetry nominal, that's flying straight and true. We do see all 33 Raptor engines lit up on telemetry screens. At this point, we've passed through that point of maximum aerodynamic pressure, that max Q. Now, coming up in just a little over a minute from now is gonna be hot staging. So we're gonna see the six engines on the ship ignite while still attached to the booster. Just before that, we'll see all but three center engines on the booster shut down. And what we call Miko, it's most engines cut off instead of main engine. And so while we continue to watch it go up, a lot of our flight controllers looking at all the systems around the tower. Again, we have to send a manual command. Just about 30 seconds away from hot staging. And we heard, we heard the tower is go for catch. Please turn your cut off. The return flag is set for true. Ship engine start up. Stage separation. All right, hot staging confirmed. Six out of six lit on the ship. 
Booster boost back going. We heard that we are go for catch. Kate, Jesse, take out the views. Hopefully I got a booster coming home real soon. Wow, from our view here, Dan, uh, great views of planet Earth behind that super heavy booster. Right now it is performing the Ship boost back burn. Phenomenal. Good news there, telling us that the uh, the pressures inside the ship are good. That is the second stage or the upper portion of the vehicle. Follow along with the telemetry on the bottom of your screen. Yeah, booster is currently super heavy. Is currently in its boost back burn. This boost ship back burn. Avionics power telemetry nominal. This boost back burn lasts just a little bit over a minute. So we've got a little. Uh, approximately 30 seconds left. We've had shutdown of that boost back burn. Up next will be hot stage jettison. The view from the camera on the left, or from the booster on the left hand side of your screen, and then tracking cam there on the right hand side of your screen. We'll see those grid fins. Booster offshore divert. And we can also see that the uh, hot stage has been jettisoned. Yes, visual confirmation of that there on your screen, which is great. Now the next... Starship is following a nominal trajectory. The next step for booster is going into that landing burn. Again, it'll light up 13 of those engines and then uh, pair down to three engines right before booster catch. All right, now just real quick, we did hear the call out. Uh, boost back, or excuse me, booster offshore divert. Unfortunately, that means that we are no-go for the catch. Um, as we said before, both the tower and the vehicle, as well as the operators on console, have been actively evaluating the commit criteria for that return to the launch tower. Um, and unfortunately, we did not have a pass on those commit criteria. So we are no-go for tower catch. And we did mention that we're constantly evaluating the criteria for catch. There's a lot of things that need to go well in order to line that up. Unfortunately, today yep. we will forego booster catch today. But what you're seeing on your screen is ship uh, currently making its way towards the Indian Ocean, still looking good so far. Exactly. So views there of the booster on the left-hand side of your screen, views of the ship on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, we said before that it was not guaranteed that we would be able to make a, uh, a tower catch today. So while we were hoping for it, like we said, it was pretty epic on attempt one, but uh, the safety of the teams and the public and, uh, and, and the pad itself are uh, paramount. So we are t accepting no compromises in any of those areas. Exactly, and we're still going to get a lot of good flight data with booster even, but especially with ship. Again, we have an additional objective today to do an in-space relight of a Raptor engine, which again will help us set us up for uh, being able to do deorbit burns, which is ship chamber pressure phenomenal. Which, yeah. which is important for orbital flights. And what you're seeing on your screen is a view from Super Heavy as it's making its way back down to Earth. Yeah, once again, we are attempting an offshore landing of the Super Heavy booster. Uh, so we have seen this before, uh, and it is still very fun <laughs> to watch, watching it come down uh, for a soft splashdown uh, off the Gulf Coast of Texas. We can see it there re-entering. Uh, we saw earlier those grid fins. There are four hypersonic grid fins. Or we can see that the landing burn has begun on the Super Heavy booster. And same pattern, 13 engines will light. Gone down to three, just as we expected. And what an incredible view of splashdown that we got today. Oh, Is super heavy. heavy. Yeah, I'm sure the buoy cam views will be <laughs> pretty awesome once again. So we'd like to confirm a water landing once again for the Super Heavy booster. Congrats to the SpaceX team uh, for making that milestone as well. Now, ship continues to look good. We can see uh, that it is, while all of that was happening, <laughs> the crowd here in Hawthorne uh, and continuing to react to all these amazing views that we're getting. The next milestone is... Starship uh, is in terminal guidance. Great news there. Uh, uh, Starship terminal guidance, referring to what we see here on our screen, the upper stage, uh, at uh, about eight 
minutes, 35 seconds or so, we have ship engine cutoff, which will be the cutoff of the, uh, the, the Raptor engines. We can see on our screen ship giving us some incredible views brought to us by Starlink. Uh, this view is also very interesting because we can see basically the receding tile line that we referred to earlier, where we mentioned we have removed a number of heat shield tiles in order to test out and push the envelope on the ship and demonstrate what its capabilities are. Ship engine cutoff. And there we just heard call out for Seco ship engine cutoff. Great news there, everything continuing to look awesome for ship. Full view looking aft on ship here. Ship, FTS is saved. Nominal orbit insertion. There's that call out we were waiting for. Confirmation of good orbital insertion for ship today. It has been a very exciting afternoon <laughs> so far. Uh, we'd like to send it back over to Dan, who can give us that uh, <laughs> live view experience. Dan, uh, once again, are you OK after witnessing <laughs> another Starship launch? Yeah, uh, totally fine. Uh, it's. You guys have to be jealous. This is the only way to do this. This is fantastic. Uh, no, it was really cool to see a lift off. 33 out of 33. Uh, didn't go for the booster catch today. Initially, we were good, and then we tripped a, a commit criteria and did the offshore divert. So we went and did that water landing, as everybody saw. Uh, we'll dig into it a little bit more. Uh, but again, this is we've done it once. We've now done it twice. We're going to keep trying to do it as this is just a core capability of Starship and what's going to make it so incredible. Uh, there's a lot left. We're just about almost 10 minutes into this flight, uh, so about 50 plus minutes still to go. Ship nominal orbit, so it's on its way around the planet. It's going to attempt to do an in-space burn. We're going to light one of those Raptor engines, the sea level ones in the middle, uh, just to help demonstrate that we can relight in that microgravity environment. Really critical for de orbit burns uh, as we start to do some orbital missions uh, in the not too distant future. Um, and then following that, we'll see a ship entry, maybe a splashdown. As you guys said, we're, we're really going to be pushing ship on this one. Uh, we're pretty much intentionally putting it in places where we expect it might not do so great. And all that's to try and help us learn, see if we were a little too conservative. And then maybe that opens up more capability for when we start catching them. But uh, I'll check back in with everybody in a little bit. Uh, I'm going to tune in and watch the ship fly around planet Earth, uh, and hopefully we see it re-entering in the not-too-distant future. Back over to you guys. Thanks, Dan. Development testing, by definition, is unpredictable, which we saw with Super Heavy splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico today, but that is exactly why we test. As is standard for these tests, the area around the pad and along the flight path was cleared prior to launch, and we expect the road and beach to, be, to remain closed until further notice. Yeah, testing development flight hardware in a flight environment is what enables our teams to quickly learn and execute design changes and hardware upgrades to improve the probability of success in the future. Please do not attempt to approach the booster in the water for your safety as well as for that of our team that will be working on recovery. Now, uh, we are going to continue though. The mission is not done. <laughs> exactly, the mission's not over, ship is still coasting. But it has been nonstop since liftoff and with the booster having completed its job for the day, we are going to take a short break for the next 35 minutes or so while ship continues to coast before re-entry. Now, as with previous flights, Starlink may enable us to talk to the ship through re-entry with no communication blackout. Now, we, still, we are still testing Starlink during this phase of flight, so nothing is completely certain. Yeah, so if we do have views, we will be sure to bring those to you live. And of course, one of those views include that of our, as we said before, surprise payload, the banana. Uh, and we are looking forward to it. So um, we're going to come back in a few minutes, around T plus 35 minutes. Exactly. Views or no views, we'll see you back here at T plus 40 minutes for our coverage of Starship's re-entry, flip maneuver, landing burn, and hopefully see a splashdown.